Then, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, like I already said, my name is Mario Werner. I'm a PhD student at Graz University of Technology. And uh, today I have the pleasure to uh, present to you our work on ScatterCache. Um, this is a joint work with, uh, with my colleagues from Graz. So with Thomas Unterlogauer, Lukas Kiener, Michael Schwarz, Daniel Gruß, and Stefan Mangard. Okay, so uh, for the beginning, let me set the expect expectations right. Uh, what is scatter cache? Um, scatter cache is basically an alternative cache design. Uh, it's also an set asso associative cache, uh, but we designed it with, uh, with counter, uh, as countermeasure against cache attacks. So, um, yeah, what does it do? It breaks the, the, the fixed link between addresses and cache sets. Uh, that we usually have in, a, in an associative cache. Um, we increase the number of possible cache sets and we introduce uh, domain IDs which allow us via software to change the concurrences in the cache. As the result, exploitation of the, of the cache in, in terms of, of, of attacks, so getting information out of the side channels, uh, should get much harder. The whole concept is based on, on, on reusing established concepts. So we basically build on skewed caches and uh, reuse low latency cryptographic primitives. And at the end, uh, the usability and the complexity, hardware complexity should be comparable to, to existing caches. As in every talk here, we have some background, but you heard already most of that, so we will go pretty fast. <laughs> uh, yeah, caches, what's their use? They basically bridge the gap between the main memory and the very fast uh, CPUs, which we have nowadays. And they're really great um, in, in, in terms of usability nowadays. So we don't have to manage them manually. We simply request a variable, like here, i. It's not in the cache. The cache automatically requests the data from the main memory, gets the response replies it to the CPU and also stores it in a cache. If we do the same again, now we have the data already in the cache and we get the cache hit and everything is fast. What's important here is, is that the, when the cache does what it is supposed to do, uh, it's slower when, uh, when it doesn't have the information it, uh, you request and it's faster if it's already there. We can measure this, um, this, this difference. So for this specific laptop, for example, uh, when I measure cache hits, uh, I get latency here on this, on this chart around 100 cycles. I mean, there's some systematic overhead, but it doesn't matter. When we look at cache misses, they are clearly at around 230 or so. So we can really separate a cache hit from a cache miss based on the timing of the, of the excesses. When we now look deeper in, into how, how modern caches work, uh, we usually have the set associative caches, meaning that we take certain bits from our address, which we request, and use those bits to, to, to determine in which entries in our cache the data can reside at all. In this specific example, we have a two-way cache, which means, two-way set associative cache, which means that um, as soon as we determine the cache set, there are two possibilities where we can store our data. And in case of reading data, we use the upper bits, the tag bits, to determine if the data is uh, what we want to have and reply the, the red data. When we write to a cache uh, in, such a ca in, in, such a, in such a concept, um, there's a replacement policy which decides in which uh, entry, which way we select in, in our cache. And there are also attacks which exploit this structure and the, null or the, the, the fact that we can see timing differences and know if there are hits or misses. And that's primary probe, for example. The idea is pretty simple. The attacker uses his knowledge over, over the cache. Uh, and in a prime step, he fills a whole cache set with all this data. Then he lets the victim execute. The victim performs his excesses or, or not. Uh, evict some of the data from the, from the attacker. And in the second step, the attacker then probes his own data and determines if data is still in the cache. If the access is fast, it's still there. If it's slow, then we have a victim access in between. And so the attacker learned that the victim accessed a certain address or cache set. 
So, why should we care about this? Um, the problem here is, like you heard in the whole session, uh, you can do a lot of stuff with, uh, with the knowledge of, uh, uh, of hits and misses in the cache. So the attacks are quite powerful, they break isolation boundaries, and even if you write correct software, you cannot be sure that your data uh, does not leak uh, to any concurrent process, for example. There are a lot of different attacking techniques. Some require shared memory, others like primary probe don't. Uh, and we have seen numerous uh, attack scenarios. So there are key loggers, key, uh, cryptographic key extraction, ASLR breaks, and stuff like that. Finally, uh, which, which is also really prominent in the last years, uh, cache attacks are an important building block, or often used building block for other micro architectural attacks like Meltdown on Spectra. So in scatter cache, we try to get rid of this problem. And the way we approach that is that we looked at how, at, at the graphical view and how caches work. So in this example, we have a really small cache with consisting of 16 cache lines only, uh, four-way set associative, so we have four sets. In a traditional cache, the attacker knows exactly what addresses he has to access um, in order to get access to certain sets in the cache. Um, and he can exploit that. The first idea which then comes up usually is let's remove this direct link. So let's get rid of this direct mapping from index bits to, to cache sets and just scramble them. So for example, if we access something which is congruent to address, uh, to address that is congruent to cache set zero, uh, place it in cache set two maybe. Um, and similar for other addresses. This idea is basically nice. Um, the problem here is there is not enough, uh, not, not enough entropy in this, in this design. So uh, what usually is, has to be done there is that you frequently rekey uh, your, your, your mapping function. Uh, and that's, for example, exactly what two publications last year did. So at DAC and also at Micro, there were two cache uh, designs which uh, used this paradigm and frequently changed the, the mapping. Uh, in scatter cache, we tried to, to yeah, we, we looked at this and asked the question, why can't we do something like that? So simply select four uh, random addresses, four random cache lines in our cache and form the set out of those. Uh, the big advantage here is that we don't have this strict alignment anymore. We get really, um, for each address we query from the cache, we get different cache sets. Uh, still there is overlap, partial overlap, but uh, it gets highly unlikely that there are full cache collisions, or cache set uh, collisions like we had before. And uh, another cool thing we can do with that is that we can introduce an additional context into the, into the mapping function. So before we had for this first address, we had uh, the upper four cache lines, and then we access the same address in a different domain, and we can pick completely different uh, addresses. So the question is, can we build this thing? So is it, is it possible, is this plausible? And the idea is still quite simple. So we introduced an, an index derivation function, which is basically a cryptographic primitive, which derives from a cache line, from a key and a domain, domain identifier, the cache indi indices which we use for, to form our cache set. Um, yeah, like, a, like you've seen before, we get unique combinations of cache sets with that, uh, and there are a lot of them. So it's basically a K, a K combination with repetition. Um, we can calculate how many those are, and if we use, for example, a, a 512 kilobyte cache, eight-way set associative, which usually would have um, 2,048 cache sets. With this design, we get two to the, 90, uh, two to the 96, more than two to the 96 cache sets. So quite a lot more. Uh, the problem here is we, we can't really, or can't really want, we, want, want, we don't really want to use this design because um, Addressing in one huge memory is, is quite intensive in, in terms of hardware. We, we need multi-port memory. Um, and additionally, is, there's the question, what happens if we have collisions in, in our indices? So if two of those indices point to the same cache line, then we have the problem that the, the associativity degrades, and uh, that's nothing which, that we want to have. 
So we want to have something which is more similar to traditional concepts. Again, on the left side, that's the standard set associative cache. We take the index bits, select the, set, the cache set. Um, the way we build our scatter cache now is we use the same index function, we, index duration function we had before, but we use the indices as indices into the indi individual ways. This um, design is not completely unseen, so it's basically a skewed cache, which is al was already published uh, in '93, uh, which is equipped with, an, with our index derivation function. And uh, it's also similar to building larger caches uh, consisting of cache slices. The consequence from this design change is that we reduce our number of possible cache sets a little bit. So now we only have uh, two to the B indices uh, ti and times n. Uh, but for the same cache we had before, we still have 2 to the 88, so this, uh, this small loss is still acceptable. And as replacement policy, uh, scatter cache always uses re uh, random replacement for now. OK, so what can we select for the index derivation function? The job of the index derivation function is to use the cache line address, the domain identifier, and the key, and to emit uh, the, the indices for the, for the cache ways. We reuse existing cryptographic primitives. I mean, it doesn't really matter what we use in, a, in, in, in spe what specific primitive we use. Uh, so we only looked at two variants. The first one is a hashing variant, where we, um, where we can build our index derivation function for either from block ciphers, from trickable block ciphers, or from per permutation-based primitives. The great thing here is that there are already primitives which fit this uh, in, in this usage model. So we have a low latency block cipher called prints, there is karma, a three cable block cipher, and there are also uh, uh, sponge-based variants uh, based on the Kajak permutation, for example, which can be implemented and computed really fast. The second variant which we looked into is a permutation variant where we only uh, permute the index bits that preserves um, the, the behavior that we don't get birthday bound index collisions. Um, the problem here is that we would need a cipher or a, a trickle block cipher that has uh, index bit block size, and that's nothing which we usually have. So there are no off the shelf primitives. And yeah, if we want to have something like that, we should talk to our crypto guys. Um, when we integrate scatter cache in our system, the idea is to use it as last level cache because it's the biggest one and the, the mostly targeted one. The hardware, the key itself is primarily managed in hardware. The idea is that the software never gets to this key and we can basically always change the key as long as the cache is, is clean. So when we don't have dirty cache lines, we can change the key, meaning also after every cache flush. And what's also possible is that we can introduce iterative rekeying uh, if we need to. And uh, interestingly, that's also a paper which was published this year at ISCA. Uh, called the technique is called Caesar S. And um, if you compare it and use the rekeying, it's it's really similar to scatter cache. The domain identifier, on the other hand, it's intended for a software tweaking knob. So we have uh, we want to expose that to the software to the operating system, as, and give it the possibility to to change the mappings. To, to allow uh, to store bigger identifiers, uh, we, we propose that we embed uh, a few bits into our page, page table entries and use the same indirection approach which uh, Intel and ARM already have as part of their attribute tables or attribute registers. By default, if we fix the identifier to zero, then we need no software support at all. So the cache operates exactly like a current cache. But if we have this additional support, uh, we can also get a few benefits. So we can separate shared read-only pages, for example, within the cache. Or we can uh, define our security domains, like, like on page granularity with processes, VMs, containers, whatever we need. And also, there is the possibility to do software rekeying. So for every page which is uh, not dirty again, we can simply change the identifier and uh, get, a new, get a new mapping in the cache. So in terms of security, uh, we 
distinguish basically three cases. The first one is completely unshared memory. Each, me each process has its own memory. Uh, there are no shared physical pages, so no shared addresses. And in this setting, flush and reload, style attacks don't work anyway. Uh, still, primary probe, which is usually applied in this setting, uh, stays applicable. Um, and we will discuss in a minute uh, how this interacts or how scatter cache interacts with that. Then we have the setting of shared read-only memory. Here we can uh, use the use the, the ID support to, to bring us back in the unshared memory setting. Uh, and finally, there's the shared write level memory scenario. Here, cache attacks are kind of pointless because the attack has already access to the, to the data anyway. Uh, so yeah, that's not really something where we make a difference. In case uh, of scatter cache and primary probes, the difference here is, um, or the problem here is that we don't, still don't have an end-to-end -end attack. Um, it's still, we, we, we still struggle with uh, modeling the new behavior of the cache sets. Uh, and the reason, or the, what we did instead is uh, the same which we do usually in cryptography. So we reduce the problem. We make it simpler and try to break that. Uh, and in our setting, we gave the attacker perfect control. He has single accesses which he wants to attack and there is no noise at all in the whole cache. And here we investigated the building blocks. First, we figured out or tried to figure out the concurrences. Our paper results here in uh, a complexity of 225, uh, which is far higher than, than in current caches. Eviction itself gets probabilistic, so we need much more addresses uh, to do that. In this case, 275 for 99% uh, uh, confidence. And we also proposed primary probe variants for this setting uh, where we show how many addresses we need. There are also new results uh, from, from uh, Punal and Verbautwer published this week, and uh, they got down to 2 to the 10, uh, which is a generalization of our attack. Uh, we also did performance evaluation, and the result is that it's basically similar to, to regular caches with a random replacement, and we are at 2 to 4%, uh, or 0 to 2%, depending on the benchmark. Uh, slower than uh, LRU. So to conclude, uh, scatter cache is basically a combination of a skewed cache with uh, low latency cryptographic primitives. We break this direct link between cache sets and addresses and um, enable the software to, to influence the mapping within the cache itself. We have comparable performance to contemporary, contemporary caches, uh, especially with the same replacement policy. And uh, it's definitely harder to attack than a contem contemporary cache. Uh, and we need newer attack approaches to, to tackle this thing. Still, we also need more analysis on that so that we figure out uh, how this works in a real more realistic model and if we need rekeying as well. So yeah, thank you to all the people who are involved uh, in this work, also my quarters, of, of course, and with that I'm at the end. And I'd be glad to take questions. OK, thank you for uh, your talk. Uh, are there any questions? So please start and introduce yourself again. Please. Hi, uh, I'm Daniel Marie from WPI. Uh, so my question is, uh, did you do any quantification in terms of uh, the entropy you use for the key and the performance? Uh, no, we, we focused here on the design itself. So we, we are not really fixed on, on the primitive itself. We, in the paper, we primar primarily used uh, Karma because it's silicon proven in this area already. Uh, but uh, we didn't look into the entropy of keys or, or implementations. And uh, when we, you were using Karma, like what was the key size or entropy for it? Uh, I think it's 96 bit or 128. It's, okay. it's, 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 uh, they're like, I mean, uh, Karma and, and prints are uh, general purpose cryptographic primitives. They are not designed for this in specific. Uh, they are for general purpose encryption or encryption authentication. So they, they use 128 bit keys and are strong in, 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 in also non plain text uh, models. Okay, stuff. thank you. Hi, my name is Guru Rajan from Georgia Tech. Uh, great work, loved it. Um, 
I had a question about the applicability of this design to other caches in the system. So for instance, private L1 caches, yep. um, given that they have different constraints around latency and sizes, would this be applicable or not applicable to them? The, the main um, question here is how fast can we get our index derivation function? Um, in the last level setting, which we evaluated, we know that the, the, the function is fast enough to, to be computed, at least in parallel to the lookup. Uh, when we want to have something for the L1 cache, we need something really fast. Uh, one thing which we proposed, but not really evaluated yet, is use a regular skewed caches, which with some masking maybe, only in, in the lower level caches, because that can be computed really fast, and you still get this benefit of breaking the alignment already. So maybe, maybe something like that should be looked into. Okay, last question, please. Hi, uh, Jan Solihin, University of Central Florida. So ni nice work. Um, I have a, a question. So do you envision like you have, uh, if you have two processes, do they reside in dif two different security domains? Like they will map differently to the cache? Uh, yeah, absolutely, that's possible. So um, we, we, we use the security domains mainly to distinguish, um, on the one hand, to break stuff which, uh, to break the coherent uh, congruency mm -hmm. where we don't want to have it, so for shared memory, for example. Um, but when you have shared memory that has to work as shared memory, you can't do that because then you have uh, no co cache coherency anymore. So, so you prevent some kind of like uh, sharing, right? Uh, sharing with yeah, yeah, inter-process sharing, you right? Uh, we we prevent it where we don't want to have it. But if we want to have it, then we have to use the same identifier anyway. Right. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Uh, have you considered uh, cache coherence? Like if you, if you receive an invalidation for, uh, externally, it only comes as a, a physical address. So you don't really have the, the security domain information anymore. Mm -hmm. And then you have to invalidate your cache and then you know, how do you find no, the block? We, we, we haven't looked into in external invalidation uh, currently. It's more like... Uh, for, for inclusive caches where you don't have, have this, don't have this problem there, it, it works certainly. And um, yeah, we, there's, there's still a lot to look into. Yeah. Right, thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.